2017 Wilderness Issues Lecture Series brought to you by the Wilderness Institute. Um, this year's theme is our map of the world using lessons that we've learned from our environmental past that can help guide us into our present and quickly approaching future. Uh, we've been looking at different case studies of environmental histories through multiple lenses to learn from them and try to better understand our present and um, an approaching future, and we've looked at them using multiple <coughs> subjects throughout the last uh, several weeks. Last week, we focused on the history of dam construction and recent deconstruction, particularly on the Elwall River in Washington. Um, environmental historian Jeff Crane talked us through what we've learned about dams in terms of the construction phases, as well as what we've learned recently <coughs> from the deconstruction and restoration of the Elwall River system. And as we think about future dam removal projects, such as some of the conversations regarding the Lower Snake River dams, we can look to this really amazing case study of, of a dam uh, restoration that's already occurred. Um, tonight, we're gonna continue our theme of environmental history and how it impacts our present and future with writer Jonathan Waterman, who has spent years writing about and exploring wild places, both as they are now and exploring through his literary works how they have been in the past. John has worked as a wilderness guide, a magazine editor, a park ranger, but is perhaps most renowned for his unprecedented mountaineering ascents, long river descents, and arduous wilderness traverses, such as his solo of the Northwest Passage, winter ascent of Denali's Cassine Ridge, and his source to sea descent of the Colorado River. The National Geographic Society has sponsored and supported many of his journeys. He's written 12 books, and they include Northern Exposures, An Adventuring Career in Stories and Images, Running Dry, A Journey from Source to Sea Down the Colorado River, and Arctic Crossing. Um, also, Where Mountains Are Nameless, which is how I first came to know John through his writing. Um, the recognition for his work includes magazine awards, a special achievement award from the National Park Service, a literary fellowship from the National Endowment of the Arts, and an Emmy. So I first came to know John without actually knowing him at all in person. <laughs> um, after my first couple solo trips in the Arctic uh, National Wildlife Refuge, I became curious about the place I was traveling. And as uh, Jeff Crane mentioned last week, I think during the question and answer session, sometimes the best way to get to know a place is through the literary works that have been written about that place. If you have the chance to read about a place while you're in a place, it's even that much more tangible in the moment. Um, so in 2004, uh, his book, Where Mountains Are Nameless, came out, and I had just finished my second uh, set of travels up in the Arctic Refuge, and it was really timely. And um, this book has, uh, has been an amazing kind of place-based lesson for me in the history of a place that I've come to know, largely through, at the beginning, John's, John's own words. Um, so this is the reason why I invited John to talk in this year's lecture series. It was his own written story of his travels in the Arctic Refuge and the history that he wrote about of those people who came before him and the establishment of the refuge and the subsequent discussions about the refuge status that we talked about in the first lecture of class that I gave. Um, it's through his work that I really felt that initial connection with place. So tonight, John is going to talk to us as um, uh, with the topic of his lecture, The Career of an Adventure uh, adventure conservationist. It's based on his journey in environmental advocacy. And he's going to do some storytelling, show us some images, and he does have books available afterwards if folks are interested in purchasing books or having books signed. So with that, I would like to welcome John to the lecture series. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming tonight. I. Uh, have an interesting topic tonight, at least for me, because recently the University of Alaska asked me to come lecture to its students who were very interested not only in what they were going to do with their lives, uh, but how they could potentially plug into careers in adventure and conservation, basically careers in the outdoors. 
And uh, typically, in the past, I've spoken on subjects all the way from river restoration to protecting wilderness and spoken a lot about just adventuring, uh, which I've managed somehow by luck or, or uh, some skill, managed to make a career out of. So uh, I put together this lecture, which uh, I also call the evolution of an adventurer, about what happened. And I was a little nervous doing it. And I, I had to fine tune it again yet tonight. Because frankly, I thought that four years of adventuring was really just impulsive and spontaneous and having fun. But when I sat down and racked my brains about it, I realized that uh, I was deliberately steering myself not only to go to certain places, uh, but to learn from these places and to share them with other people. And then ultimately, uh, the message that I hope to leave with you all tonight is to pay it forward uh, as outdoors people, as we all must do in this shrinking world of ours uh, uh, with uh, threatened wildlife and wilderness areas. So, Seek out the intangible spiritual values of wildness. That first came to me through one of my heroes, a, a man named Olas Muri, who wrote a book called uh, Animal Tracks. He was an expert tracker. And that, for me, encapsulated, even as a teenager, well, what I wanted to do. It's something inexplicable, intangible, about what I loved at that point at 16 years old, growing up in New England. Uh, and I quickly fell in love with the winter time. The winter time, uh, particularly above tree line, uh, not only because people didn't like to go up above tree line in the winter time where it was sub-zero and windy, uh, because, but because I thought it was spectacularly beautiful. And so I learned all the requisite skills that you have to learn to not only travel and camp and build igloos, but also how to climb ice, which I became quite fond of. But I learned many lessons along the way, and, and particularly for climbing ice, when you have all these sharp points on your feet and in your hands, you have to be safe. Because if you're not safe, you're, you're going to be in a world of hurt. As I learned uh, when I fell as a 16-year-old soloing a, a steep ice, and I was very lucky to get away with just a dislocated shoulder and a broken leg. So it, it's not. Uh, a coincidence that I've got this particular image here sitting with my brother uh, near Boston, Massachusetts, where I grew up. Uh, but we're both wearing football uh, uh, uniforms because we both played football. And I think that uh, it's, it's worth examining the idea that a lot of us, uh, from in my past, and I know that my children as well, uh, don't often have the opportunities to experience wilderness and adventures in the outdoors because a lot of the opportunities that are presented to us are uh, competitive sports. So for me, this was a chance to get rid of the football uniform and actually pursue something that I could do for my entire life. And then um, immediately I found out that I, I wanted to share the experience. At first because I couldn't explain to my peers what it was I, I, that I was doing, you know, going off and getting injured in the mountains and, and uh, forsaking all else to be in the outdoors. So uh, it was not only to share the experience to explain myself, but because these experiences I was having, whether climbing here at Mount Logan in the Yukon Territories, uh, were exceptionally beautiful. And I wanted to share this, th these beauties of the natural world. And it's no surprise that a lot of my photos tend to have uh, human beings actually as shrunken uh, figures uh, amid this big landscape. In fact, uh, uh, that the landscape often had animal forms to it, as you see that elephant there. Uh, st whether standing on top of these high peaks in Canada or Alaska or here, this unclimbed peak in the Himalayas, I was always uh, looking for that, that image s so that I could share uh, what it was that drew people to the outdoors, and that it wasn't a crazy pursuit. And uh, this eventually led me to culture as well as, as landscapes. And the photography, strangely enough, eventually led me uh, within a, just a couple of years to being a writer. But you know, when you're young and the hormones are raging in you, um, you also want to challenge yourself. And the old uh, uh, Abraham Maslow precept of self-actualization self meant a lot to me. In other words, 
that I, I believed, uh, as Abraham Maslow, the philosopher, preached, that you could find yourself, literally find yourself by uh, creating a life path that you could self-actualize. And so one of my big dreams <coughs> was to do something that had never been done before that would kind of shock people, but to do it in a fashion where I wasn't sticking my neck literally in the guillotine. And um, that was uh, an attempt on the, the highest mountain in North America, Denali, by one of its most difficult routes called the Cassin Ridge in the middle of winter. Uh, it's not uh, climbed in the winter because it's, uh, it's uh, a, a very hostile environment. I flew in with two other friends in February of 1982, and it was 30 below, not counting the, the wind chill. We learned that we couldn't set up tents even down here on the glacier, and the only way to get shelter was to dig down into the snow. And once we had a big hole, then we could dig into the side of that hole and eventually have a snow cave to seek shelter from this you know, desperate cold. You know, wind chills easily of uh, 80, 90 below zero. And my companions were pretty disparate people. We, on one hand, on the right, you're looking at an Ivy League a teetotaling scholar. And on the left, you see uh, a friend from Great Britain who is, is uh, partaking in his medicinal herbs. <laughs> and so I was stuck somewhere between these two guys. And uh, here at the bottom in one of our scraped out desperate snow caves, uh, waiting for the weather to clear so we can do something that is, is uh, it was really the most brazen thing I've ever done in my life. We, however, uh, were not foolhardy in that we were inc incredibly well trained. We prepped for nearly a year for this climb. We designed our own equipment. At that time, there wasn't a lot of good equipment. Gore-Tex just, had just barely come out. We had a seamstress make us uh, full suits. We had three layers, two layers of one layer of gloves and two layers of mittens because you couldn't touch metal when it was this cold. And climbing in this kind of cold was, was really going to be a trick. It was one thing to ski or walk up a flat glacier. But uh, once we got on the, the steep part of the mountain, we knew we had our work cut out for us. And that started pretty quickly the last day of uh, February. And uh, up we went up this steep ice. And we had this just miraculous weather. Lots of sun, a fair amount of wind, but the weather was holding. It was clear that this is our window to make a dash for the top of North America. And this is what we come for, you know, grabbing uh, granite in one hand and swinging an axe in the other hand. This, to a climber, is like a, uh, going to Mecca. Uh, so we had reached Mecca at this point, but uh, we could no longer dig snow caves. And we had one tiny, light, light little tent because it was just so rock hard, icy, and, and granite walls that there was nothing to dig into for shelter. And the tent would only fit two of us. Uh, so that night, I got the short straw and slept outside on this ledge on a, a, a balmy Donali winter 40 below evening. Uh, but I couldn't sleep. And, and the reason I couldn't sleep that night is because the northern lights were blazing. And it was a show like I'd never seen uh, before or since. Uh, seen from up high at altitude, about 15,000 feet in the clear air. Uh, and I kept raving about the forms I was seeing to my two friends inside the tent. So they weren't getting much sleep either. Uh, and so the climb continued to, uh, to make a long story short, I, I contracted uh, high altitude pulmonary edema and I could barely stand up. And I crawled the last. Uh, a uh, thousand feet to the, the summit ridge, and, and uh, luckily enough, as you can see, the weather held. Uh, it was so cold we couldn't even hold our metal ice axes through three layers of mittens. Uh, but we we did pay a very high price. Two of us were were mildly frostbitten, and the uh, the third, the, uh, Roger the Brit, uh, fell into a crevasse and separated the ligaments in his knee. Um, and to to make matters even worse. Our bush pilot had, was on a, a long drunk and forgot about us. And so we're 80 miles from the, from the bush pilot's uh, town. And uh, we spent you know, one day, two days, turned into a week. And then finally, it was 10 days, we actually stamped a giant OUT in hopes that a passing jetliner would see it. And finally, a, 
another bush ball just happened to be flying by and saw that OUT. And, um, I felt like that I needed to, to rearrange my adventure schedule. I felt like this was not going to end well if I kept up these sorts of climbs. Moreover, I thought that what I was doing was, was as a climber, was essentially narcissistic. In other words, I was out for, for these feats for myself, and I wasn't really doing any kind of service to others. And luckily, at this very time, uh, the, 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 somehow the, the people believed that the climb wasn't totally foolhardy, and the National Park Service offered me a job, and I became a Denali mountaineering ranger for the next several years. The best years of my life, uh, not only here out in the wilderness, occasionally wearing a uniform, uh, pretending to look for, for uh, people that shouldn't be here, but mostly getting to know this magnificent park and spending a lot of time up on the mountain, as it turned out, uh, conducting rescues and advising other climbers how not to get into trouble uh, on this, this place that I've come to know and love over the last 40 years. I saw in my first season there uh, eerily striking patterns patterns behind a lot of these mishaps, whether it be climbing falls or, in this case, frostbite. Uh, typically, people weren't drinking enough water or wearing the right boots uh, to get this kind of frostbite. Uh, and uh, these accidents would happen again and again because of the same uh, remarkably stupid mistakes. For instance, cooking in your tent without opening the, the door wide enough to get ventilation at high altitude gives you carbon monoxide poisoning, which predisposes you to high altitude pulmonary edema. So I resolved to tell the climbing world about this and, and uh, pay something forward. And this is what uh, started my, as it turned out, my career as a writer. And again, following that model of sharing what I was learning, and this time through the written word rather than just through photographs. So I published my first book, and in the next four years, I published two more books. It was a remarkably productive time for me, uh, and it, it really also jump-started what would be a, 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 a fun and, and very challenging writing career. But it wasn't enough for me. I learned after several years of quitting the Park Service and becoming a, a part-time guide and a full t um, the rest of the time a writer, to just write books. I felt like I wasn't reaching a, a, a big enough audience or the right audience. So I, did, I started becoming more and more creative with media and started making television films. At that time, there, there weren't so many channels around. and It was a lot easier to get funding for these big film projects. For instance, one year, going back to that giant peak in Canada, Mount Logan, and trying to, to, uh, to climb to the top with uh, dog teams and I got my own dog team that year, 1991, uh, and learned how to, to ride dogs that had won the Iditarod, the very dogs that had won the Iditarod that year, uh, all the way into to Mount Logan. And then again the next year, back to Denali, making yet another film uh, and climbing the mountain as the pioneers climbed it without using planes. In other words, we had to, to come in again with dog sleds, uh, nearly. Uh, uh, 40 miles from the north. And once we got to the top and the camera was rolling, this was pre-digital cameras, I had prepared a statement there on the summit. And the statement was that, you know, we don't climb mountains to conquer them. We climb mountains to revere them and uh, pay our respects to the surrounding wilderness. And it, it, it actually came out pretty well, maybe even better than I just said it, particularly at 20,310 feet. Uh, but I had a lot to learn about TV. I would do other TV productions. And that whole speech was cut out. And they shot the final footage and cut the final footage so it looked uh, like uh, I was actually standing on top of the summit when, in fact, I, part of my statement was that we don't climb mountains to get to the tops of them necessarily. And I was standing three feet below it. So I had a lot to learn. And what I really wanted to do, what I, since I was a teenager, I wanted to defend the environment. I was a great fan of the writer who me, you may know, uh, Ed Abbey, who was a defender of, of the desert places in the, in the desert southwest. 
And uh, it can be an anathema to a writer's career to actually take these kinds of political stances that you have to take when you become an environmentalist. And I was, my publisher tried to talk me out of it, but I convinced them that I could combine an environmental book with a, with a great journey. And so I paddled the length of the Sea of Cortez in Mexico, which was a, a remarkable wilderness journey because there are many wild stretches, or at least there were back in, in 1993. But what I saw deeply disturbed me. This, the, I saw what had been happening for more than a decade. The sea was being badly overfished. Gringos coming down from San Diego and just you know, overfilling their pickup beds with tuna or other fish species. Uh, no regard for limiting your take, let alone uh, trying to sustain the species. Or mantas that were just kind of uh, killed, these beautiful creatures, their wings scalped off and left to die on the, on the beach. And they would take that meat from the wings and sell them in taco stands. So I wrote a book about the, uh, partially about the adventure, but moreover about the environmental destruction of a beautiful sea, which uh, unfortunately I think is still continuing today. So as part of that, that teenage uh, uh, passion to extend myself and test myself, I wanted to do uh, one expedition that was a lengthy solo and just push myself to the limits and see how I would perform on my own. And uh, I'd long been in, been in love with the concept of going all the way across the Arctic. I knew that going on a long solo in the mountains would be a lot dangerous, so I substituted the Arctic. But I also, you'll note that it, the title of this, what I have to tell you here, is about seeking the power within. And that has to do with, with wanting to see a polar bear. I'd only seen polar bears like this here in the San Diego Zoo. But I wanted to see one in the wilds uh, without protection of guides. I wanted to figure out how to travel safely through not only polar bear habitat and grizzly habitat, but to actually come across uh, some polar bears. So this journey uh, would take me three years, actually 10 months spread over three years during the springs and summers. And I lived in the uh, villages for a couple of months in the winter when there's no daylight at all. And I started from Prudhoe Bay, Alaska, and went all the way from the Pacific tides uh, here to the Atlantic tides, uh, a little over 2,000 miles. But this landscape is the most, and seascape is the most remarkable place I've been in the world. Uh, the, the kinds of things you see here without trees, to, they take a lot of adjusting because there's, there's no buildings or trees to speak of in much of the Canadian and Alaskan Arctic. So you're completely lacking in perspective. And sometimes you don't know whether you're looking at, in this case, I thought I was looking at oil barrels or animals. So I would put my head down and paddle a little further, then look up again to see if my first guess was correct. And in this case, it turned out to be one of the more uh, amazing uh, species in the Arctic, uh, the musk ox. So I also have to, uh, to, to, if you'll forgive the expression, bring home the bacon. I had to, to share this trip, and not only make a television film, but to write a book about it. I had to somehow capture images and video that would show this, this extraordinary seascape. Uh, so uh, in this instance, I uh, figured out how to, to uh, attach my camera to the top of a mast on my kayak. And I traveled in this kayak for almost all of those 2,000 miles. And when it was windy, as you can see, I have outriggers there that would prevent the kayak from flipping over. And obviously, those of you who have shot pictures before know that this is a fisheye lens. And so it uh, 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 distorts the horizon a little bit. But I knew that once I got out in the sea ice, maybe I could capture an image that would really show uh, the, the sense of remoteness and, and, and beauty of the, the far north. Of course, little did I know when I took the shot that it would end up on the cover of my book. And to this day, I, I, I like to believe that the designers in New York think that this is how it looks when you're on the South Pole, on the North Pole, looking south <laughs> down to the lower southern biosphere. So I also had to capture, as I mentioned, video footage in order to, uh, to make this television film. And I had to go through all kinds of crazy gyrations to put a camera in the right place and, and then use a sort of a timer or a remote like I'm holding now to get 
good footage. So I'm going to share with you uh, a little bit of the, some of that footage that I shot. Versus Harblius. Be a bad thing to get on a road wave right now and ride it in the shore. It's coming over to check me out. Hello, Mr. Bear. It's the second bear I've seen in an hour's time. And I'm obviously coming into the barren ground grizzly habitat. Lots of ground squirrels, lots of good grays. Uh, probably young caribou's around. There's musk oxen off in the distance here. So I'm going to have to be real careful with Canton. Dan is using swimming after me. Lone campers are highly susceptible to bear attacks. As a safety precaution, John uses a tent outfitted with special bear spotting windows. I uh, had a, a long night last night. I counted uh, 19 bears in the space of about six hours. And um, when I finally set up the tent, uh, I set the alarm for every hour or so just to wake up and make sure that they weren't uh, going to be ripping apart my kayak or, or coming into the tent, but um, not a problem. Didn't see a bear all night long. Okay, you get the idea. Um, I was instructed to use my body language to show when I was miserable, and, and that might have been the height of misery for me. But there are other moments of just sublime peace, and I've learned uh, something I'd never experienced before, that when you're alone, and you know, it would take me a week every time I left a village, and sometimes I'd be a month between villages, to really let go of my anxiety and begin to relax and actually sleep well at night. And it was extraordinary because the animals could sense this. And after this week's time, uh, consistently, I would see animals like this bearded seal uh, swimming circles around my kayak or the caribou coming down to the shore, fearlessly checking me out, and, or the wolves uh, howling at what constitutes uh, uh, darkness here in the Arctic. This is at midnight. The wolves howling a, a couple of miles away. So for me, it was a remarkable connection and a, an opportunity to use instincts that I think that we all have inside of us, these remnant instincts, to know when you're near an animal or to sense uh, potential danger. And, and these were the things that I believe uh, kept me safe. So I, of course, I, I did reach the, the Atlantic tides. And uh, I was a little bit torn once I got there because uh, I wanted to continue another 200 miles to the next village. But everything changed when I'd gotten out past this peninsula into these tides. And where before the water had been pretty calm, now there were 22-foot tides. And icebergs were uh, often rushing by as, as fast as I could paddle. Uh, moreover, I was seeing lots and lots of ring seals, which is a the, the preferred snack for polar bears. And I'd seen fleeting glimpses of polar bears, but I'd never really seen them up close. And so proceeding onward, to, torn about what to do, I came around a long, another long peninsula and turned the corner. And uh, there in the water, um, I was fairly close to this polar bear swimming around in the water and had my camera on deck and quickly snapped a, a picture. Uh, but then uh, everything changed very quickly, and the bear started swimming after me. And for a moment, a kind of panic, just not thinking, sort of going to that reptilian part of your brain, 
I went to the flight uh, mode and started paddling away, which was a huge mistake uh, because you can't out paddle a polar bear. They're incredible creatures, not only on land but in the water. Uh, so I did something again on instinct. I stopped and, and swung the kayak around and uh, put my hands down, uh, took a quick picture, and, uh, and then bowed to the bear uh, to show my sense of respect. And it worked. The bear stopped swimming after me and clambered out onto uh, an iceberg. Now the Inuit, particularly the polar Inuit, know this animal as uh, tenorsuk is, is what they call it. And tenorsuk literally translated means uh, 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 the one who gives power. So that was the end of my journey across the Northwest Passage, a, a most appropriate place to turn around and go back to the last village and, and call it good. So of course, in, in my time in the North, I've returned repeatedly. I was up there before and I've been up there several times since. I've been aware of a myriad of changes because the, the Arctic is the canary in the, in the cold mine for our changing world when it comes to climate. And here, I'm just briefly going to show you one of the many things that are happening in the Arctic. Uh, things that we're just beginning to experience on a smaller scale in our southern biosphere. But here, you're looking at what scientists refer to as perennial sea ice cover. And this is the extent of the sea ice uh, where, where you find the sea ice uh, in the summer times. And every year, it would come back to about that, give or take. Uh, 50 miles. This is Alaska here, and this is all of Canada where I made my long voyage. But if we fast forward the clock to, to last year and one of the warmest years on record, that perennial sea ice uh, is looking very, very different. Uh, and is, why is this a bad thing in addition to simply losing the sea ice? Well, the sea ice provides as well as cover for for the uh, polar bear and a hunting platform uh, and for all other kinds of sea creatures. Uh, it also performs what scientists refer to as uh, albedo. It's a reflective surface that reflects the heat of the sun off away from the Arctic. And with that sea ice diminishing, the ocean tends to absorb the heat of the sun. And this is one of the many factors that's bringing us to what's referred to as a, a tipping point. So, uh, it wasn't enough to just share these things and to write about them. Uh, I wanted to really try and get in, involved in movements to defend places. And in all these visits I've made north, there's one place I kept returning to, and it's that place uh, in, in northern Alaska where the mountains come closer to the sea than they do anywhere else on the roof of America uh, or Canada. Uh, you can see the Brooks Range very close, and there's this incredibly verdant coastal plain, and then there's these glaciated peaks right beyond, and it happens to be a mecca for wildlife. But there's just one problem with this beautiful place that uh, you heard Natalie describing uh, her journeys there. Uh, they know that there is a large amount of oil here in this Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. It's a place that's 19 and a half million acres, which is the size of this state of South Carolina. And this one and a half million acre tip of it, uh, no, referred to as the coastal plain, that verdant area uh, where a lot of the wildlife convenes every summer, is the place where uh, the oil can be found. So this is a map, as you may have, well, it's not even on here. Uh, but uh, this simply shows you areas that are now open to uh, oil leasing. Fortunately, uh, under the last administration, all these offshore areas were closed very recently before Obama left office. But you can see that, uh, amazingly, all of northern Alaska is essentially open uh, to oil development. And having paddled and walked through these places, I can tell you it's, it's like entering the apocalypse. You go from this pristine wilderness and you come into industrial zones. It's the, one of the most jarring transitions imaginable to say nothing about the impact upon uh, things, for instance, like the porcupine caribou herd that calves here on the coastal plain of the Arctic Refuge, uh, which has numbered as many as 120,000 animals. It's one of the largest international migratory species every year. It comes in from Canada 
into the Arctic National Wildlife there in, in northern Alaska, and all the predators follow it. So it's, it's really akin to the North American Serengeti, uh, in my humble opinion. And traveling both outside the refuge and in the refuge, there's, of course, many other wildlife species. Uh, this happens to be a nest of rough leg hawks. They're nesting in an abandoned uh, floodlight on an abandoned uh, airstrip outside of Prudhoe Bay, outside of the refuge. But uh, I had learned that in abandoned buildings and here on this abandoned bear strip, airstrip, in abandoned buildings I've seen evidence of grizzly bears coming in and sleeping on the, the beds, the bunk beds, uh, and other animals taking up residence. And the message was quite clear. If, if we can leave it alone, let alone protect it, nature really does endure. It has a resonance, but uh, there's only so far that it can go. And these species, if you're paying attention, whether up in the air or down on the ground, this animal, the, the Arctic ground squirrel, is the greatest uh, hibernator on the planet. Uh, and they're now studying this animal to figure out how astronauts might travel for years in interstellar space because it can make, it put the bears to shame when it comes to lowering its body temperatures uh, and sleeping the entire winter, as well as being an incredibly uh, cute little animal. But again, that uh, interface between the, the um, coastal plain and the sea is just, uh, it, it's, to me, it's haunting. I, I keep going back for more. I feel like I'm an addict. Um, but not to do, it has nothing to do with journeys or conquest or any sort of physical thing other than just being there and sensing and getting to know the land and the sea. And it, it is a place where you, uh, you can see much further than many other places because these mirage airs bend the horizon and you can actually see beyond what's normally a, a visible horizon. But there are other changes. Uh, and the one that might be even more grave than uh, losing the sea ice in the Arctic is actually uh, the permafrost. And here you can see it a little bit indirectly as we're paddling along the coast of the Arctic Refuge. Um, you see all this water coming down. Now this is a somewhat natural phenomenon. In the summer, you know, the areas of exposed permafrost melt. Uh, and you're probably wondering what permafrost is. It's, it's literally you know, uh, uh, permanently frozen ground, uh, sometimes a, as deep as a meter under the ground. This is what it looks like. Um, but because of the warming, because of the loss of sea ice, and because of the shorter seasons and less snow and rain instead of snow, this permafrost is rapidly melting. And this permafrost is found throughout the circumpolar Arctic, as you see here. Now, now there's the projected sea ice extent, we're actually getting pretty close to it right now. So this is an old map. And uh, that's where it used to be in the early 80s. And uh, the permafrost is, uh, was a decade ago, this is the extent of the permafrost around the circumpolar Arctic, that is throughout North America and uh, the rest of the, the circumpolar Arctic. And this is where they project the permafrost moving to at the present state of warming. And again, the reason this is so dangerous is because it's, it, there's so much of it. Um, in, in Siberia, they are astonished by these huge lakes that are just disappearing as the, the ice underneath the lakes, sometimes hundreds of feet thick, is just completely melting. Uh, and that's releasing the methane gas that's been held in the ice for eons and, uh, and increasing the effects of greenhouse warming. Here is yet another phenomenon of the Arctic known as off ice. Uh, this particular trip I took in 2006 uh, with support from the National Geographic Society. I uh, took a, an expedition with uh, graduate students and a, a famed wildlife biologist paddling down a river and visiting uh, villages and uh, spending time just out in the wilderness. But we're passing by this, this chunk of off ice. Uh, and to understand, if you haven't been to the Arctic, it, just, I'm curious by a show of hands, have any of you been north of tree line in the, uh, the Canadian or Alaskan Arctic? It, yeah, just a few of you. So you know uh, that the rivers north of the Brooks Range 
Uh, they don't thaw out completely in the summer. It's just that the, it's so cold in those winters that the summers can't completely melt the off ice. So we found some pictures uh, from 1910 uh, here in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge that show that off ice in the summer of 1910, more than a century ago. Uh, and with a lot of trouble, we found where that photographer took this picture. He actually climbed to the top of a mountain. He hadn't, hadn't told anyone where he took the picture, but by lining things up, we were able to climb that mountain and retake that photograph. And this is what you see of that off ice, you know, severely diminished. So is this in scientific evidence? Maybe not absolutely, because we don't know if it's just a warm summer. Uh, so uh, more to come. We visited with other scientists who have been doing research here now for literally three and a half decades at the North Slope of Alaska. And they've conducted all kinds of experiments. And this is yet another phenomenon that is frightening. They built a simple little, uh, 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 like a vegetable hoop house, and just put it up over the tundra. And all of these uh, uh, shrubs here, most of them are willows, but there's a lot of uh, interesting little uh, colonies of life here in the tundra. You see how everything has grown in just a couple of years' time. And this is what happens. The, they estimated that they warmed the temperature inside this little hoop house by about 3 degrees Fahrenheit. And this is what happens when you warm the Arctic. Things begin to grow. And it's a phenomenon that scientists are now referring to as the greening of the Arctic. So we found another picture in 1910. This is looking down the, the huge river that we are going down at the off ice, of course. And these are, you know, in many places in the US, these would be rivers, but they're just creeks in the Arctic Refuge. Uh, and so if we fast forward the clock 100 years and look at those, those features, we see the off ice, of course, has diminished again. Um, but what's really uh, frightening, again, is that what's referred to as the, the greening of the Arctic. All these, these uh, small rivers that were just bare gravel beds are now growing over with 10-foot high willows uh, in the course of the last century. And this also is happening throughout uh, the circumpolar Arctic. So of course, it's a, a place that uh, I recommend you all go to if you get the chance uh, because of its amazing life forms. For instance, even the, this plant, the Arctic poppy, will we'll sit and kind of you can watch it if you have a day to kill. It'll spin around following the sun. And there are any number of small yet uh, just striking mysteries like that that bring me back again and again, and that we really need in our culture uh, and for future generations. We need the mystery of places where we can't discern whether we're looking at a whale's tail or an iceberg. And to me, that's one of the, the great subtle charms of the Arctic. So that year, I, I just finished a book that Natalie was referring to uh, and also made a film for PBS. And the final uh, flourish for me was something that I believe that we all need to do as citizens in this great democracy of ours is, is head to DC and go talk to your representative, wherever you're from, and urge them to protect uh, these special places. Speak up for your causes. They, they want to hear you. And so this is how my career has kind of turned on its head, uh, paying it forward, uh, whether it's uh, in the far Arctic or working on causes uh, in the Southwest related to depletion of rivers, this particular uh, poster went viral and really helped us get the word out about uh, what water conservation means in the Southwest. In 2012, I had the good fortune to be a journalist on a scientific research ship, and we sailed from San Diego to Hawaii, and as you can imagine, in some very bumpy conditions. And uh, every day of that 35-day trip, we scooped up plastic uh, and counted plastic to uh, ascertain plastic contaminations of our oceans. And so for me, this is, this is what it's, it's been about for the last 
uh, for decades, creating books, trying to share it, whether, whether in, uh, by the written word, through images, or, or with you here tonight. And uh, of course, uh, it's, it's not over with yet for me. Uh, and last summer, uh, 40 years after the first time I went to this highest peak in Alaska, I went back and by uh, extreme stroke of luck, I made it to the summit of North America again on the day of my 60th birthday. So that's all I have for you. Maybe, maybe you have some questions for me. We'll get some lights on here. Yeah, in the very back. Um, th so the question was about how we make these places more accessible, particularly Alaska, so that people understand what we might be losing. And I, I'm doing what I know how to do. I, I think, that, however, the best way to reach people, if you're to choose one piece of media, it's film, whether it's short films on the internet or films and adventure festivals, because in, in my experience, people will watch a film uh, many more people will watch a film before they uh, read a book. Uh, and uh, of course, enticing people to go there is just more footsteps across the, the fragile tundra. Uh, but, um, and, but I think there are ways to alleviate that impact too that, that uh, we're becoming more and more sophisticated about. So I'll turn that one back on you and encourage you to find uh, ways to to expand the media uh, and attention span of people that don't understand Alaska. It is it, it really a foreign country to many people. Yes? <clears throat> is shipping through the Northwest Passage inevitable, and what do you expect the change to be if it is? Well, there are huge cultural ramifications to shipping in the, in the Arctic. First of all, to these Inuit communities that are now, well, they were isolated. Um, by the sea ice and lack of contacts with ships. But now more and more ships have gone through. A couple of sailboats have made it through. It's not just kayaks at this point. And uh, then uh, there are a lot of animals that actually go across the sea ice, you know, sometimes dozens of miles uh, to these islands. And the, the Canadian archipelago of islands is, is beauty to be experience and, there's, and a lot of the wildlife migrates back and forth, particularly caribou. So as the sea ice melts more and more, uh, the, it changes the, the movements, uh, let alone the wildlife <laughs> itself. Um, how is it going to change the Arctic? Well, you know, of course, inevitable s spills, whether they're small or large, could be devastating in, in, this, in some of the richer marine habitats. Uh, and it's, it's a great question because it is beginning to happen because crossing the Arctic, there's no, you don't have to pay the fees of the Panama Canal. And it is a short route if you are going from Europe to, to Asia, maybe shorter than the Panama Canal. So it's something we have to start paying attention to. Yes? Oh, it's a good question. It, you must be a climber. Yeah. <laughs> um, it, yeah. That it, relatively few, and it, you don't normally when I climb Denali, you don't you don't have a headlamp in your toolkit because you don't need it in the summers. But in the winter time, 
it's terrible to be out there at 40, 50 below with just a headlamp to light your way. Uh, so, you know, we started with, uh, you know, maybe nine hours of daylight. And by the end of the trip uh, in mid-March, we were seeing something closer to 11 hours of daylight, more like the lower, the southern biosphere. But it was, a, that was a, I forgot, that was something to be reckoned with. But, you know, then again, I got to see the northern lights, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, you're talking about adventure seeking being related to narcissism a little bit and how you learn to have a different approach or paint it forward. Um, I was wondering what your view is with like the evolution of adventure seeking, how we're seeing more base jumping and squirrel suits, and, you know, jumping out path them. What your view is of that if there's an avenue of that of paying it forward or it's just more for the film bit? Yes. Uh, you know, I, it's hard for me to, to answer that, but I worry about it a lot. I've never used a squirrel suit, and the reason I haven't is because I'm afraid I would like it. <laughs> uh, no, I'm serious, because I dream of flying like I, I guess many people do. Um, but without pronouncing judgment on activities like that, I worry about it because um, th there's, there's so much adrenaline inherent in that kind of an activity, jumping off a cliff and pulling your chute at the, at the right instant without hitting anything before you hit, land on the ground, it demands so much you know, concentration that I don't think there's any, I, I can't imagine there'd be a whole lot of, you don't have time to look at the beauty of the cracks on the wall like a climber might do. But I don't know, and I won't know until I, until I put a squirrel suit on. But for all I know, there 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 might be people out there that are that are great uh, conservationists and environmentalists and, and members of their community, uh, figuring out how to pay it forward, and that's just how they they get their rocks off. You should try it. Let me know. <laughs> yes. Yeah, the, the longest I had to carry my food was for uh, about 420 miles, and that took me a little over a month. And by uh, tying food on top of my kayak, I was able to go a month. But I had a very bulky, beamy kayak. It's a German built canvas boat. It's kind of slow and tubby and it allowed me to stuff a lot of food in there. But I, I ate mostly freeze-dried food. I had a shotgun in case things went awry and I needed to hunt to, to continue eating. And I never did. And I did deliberately never fished, uh, even though I love to fish because it's the quickest way to bring in bears. So I, I had food that was all sealed and and we would like to believe that the bears aren't as likely to smell that food as they are when you're hunting, eating off the land. Yeah, again. Yeah, I have a question about the Arctic, which you mentioned, but I don't think I understand the implications. Yeah, yeah, because in fact, because the, the, the more trees we have, uh, the more uh, we can actually uh, uh, dispel the, the, the gases, right? right? So I don't really know the answer to that question other than to say that the greening of the Arctic is one of those phenomena that shows how our world is radically changing. And it might not have the, the uh, repercussions of, uh, but you know, for whatever carbons are absorbed and uh, are uh, by this greenery, uh, you have an increase in the warming. Uh, because you have this added greenery and you have a dearth of the albedo factor because the trees, the tall willows poke out of the, uh, the snowpack. So that's the, I don't, I don't know if it, those two things offset one another. Yeah. So what scared you the most on all your adventures? Uh, well, um, I think the thing that consistently has scared me the most is that when you, when you plan to do something and you don't know if you can do it, rather than the specific bears or 
avalanches or rock falls. You, you know, when you begin one of these journeys and you try to plot it out, the, what really scares you is your own mind and you, your own, you know, feeling of limitations. And that's again and again been a great lesson for me because I never really get over it. I always think that I can't do it. And this might be one of the reasons like, that people like me are drawn to doing these things is because it helps me uh, it, it, uh, prove things to myself. It's a very private little game that I play with myself. If I can do that, then I can do this. And I try to let it apply to the rest of my life. Yeah. Do you have a preferred mode of transport or craft for your long solo adventures? Well, I love kayaks because, you know, I've backpacked all my life and carried heavy packs, and I don't like that so much. But the great thing about kayaks is that you can put the kitchen sink in there. And if you're traveling with another person or two other people, you can, you can go more than a month without any resupply. And if, you, you know, if you're not in bear country, then you can bring fishing rods and you can go even longer. Um, so to me, the, the kayak is the ideal transportation. It's, it's just a great way to be self-sufficient. You can throw it all in there. But you, I never, I've never been sloppy about it. I've always had a problem, for instance, with river rafting because those guys and gals do tend to bring the kitchen sink. And that, that you know, there has to be a, a, there's a thin line between having a wilderness experience and a party for a month. <laughs> Yeah. I'm just curious, you, you mentioned starting your journey at 16, reading a book by Olaf Smyrna, who's quite famous for his work with legislation and the Wilderness Act in particular. And then your journey took you around, and, and that's how you kind of ended with your belief in that role with legislation. So it took you quite a while to kind of get from where Olaf inspired you with where he started or where you. Yeah, it, it was a slow journey, but I've got a lot of years left. I'm wondering about the rest of us. You know, in terms of the way the world's changing, can we afford the time of that journey? Do you have thoughts on that? Yeah, that's a wonderful question because right now we're seeing the greatest protests in the world. And, you know, now more than ever before, you know, look at what's happening in these town halls where people are really coming out and speaking their minds and, you know, visiting their, their lawmakers. Um, I think w for the first time, maybe we might have the opportunity to really become a a fully a democratic process uh, by taking advantage not only of simple things like voting, but, but reaching out and trying to affect change, uh, if not through legislation, uh, within your community. And I think that's one of the best ways to do it, is to start small. Um, I don't, you don't necessarily go, need to go to DC or work on that high level. I think change is affected a lot more readily uh, on a community level. I don't know if I'm answering your question, but it's a good one. Do you have thoughts on how to shorten that timeline? Like, <laughs> how do we get people, young people, people in this room involved to do that? What well, th that timeline can't, was uh, shortened, you know, effectively. If you write letters, send emails, um, you can effectively do that without taking a trip. Um, you can get others involved with social media. We have so much power now to mobilize people to protest, to march. It, you know, I saw the 60s, as, as you may have too, and uh, what was happening then is, seems to be happening again. <coughs> Potential revolution and outcry. Uh, so social media would r radically shorten uh, things for me if it was available when I wanted to figure out how to become a, a better conservationist. Yeah, Natalie. Yeah, I was just wondering if you could talk a tiny bit about, given your book um, about the Arctic Refuge and coming out in the early 2000s when the debate was very much alive on the Area 1002 and potential wilderness designation. <coughs> we're seeing that debate again because it has never been officially permanently protected. Um, are you engaged in that dialogue right now? Is there? I mean, Patagonia picked it up, so there's been a resurgence in that regard, but I was just wondering if you could speak at all to that particular issue, given that it's kind of one of these things that's gone on for quite a while now. 
Yeah, in 2007, it was, it was a powerful movement because there was a Republican majority that had a, uh, a bill to open the, that coastal plain and begin drilling for oil. And it, it seemed like an impossible battle to fight because not only because of the Republican majority, but there's just momentum for that to happen. The price of the oil barrel was high. Uh, and remarkably, the, just to give you a quick history, the Environmental Coalition defeated it, defeated what was, that was known as the budget bill in 2007. And now here we are again, exactly 10 years later. Uh, and the good news is that uh, I don't, I, I'm not sure that the Arctic Refuge is in the gun sites fully yet because the price of the oil barrel is so low and we have so much production going on right now and the Saudis have been messing with things too. So I don't think it is in the gun sites immediately. It is, you know, if you were at, to ask the Alaskan legislators. But what is happening, uh, scarily, is that um, a lot of Alaska, according to uh, uh, environmentalists I know up there and elsewhere in the coalition believe that Alaska's kind of fallen off the map because we've had eight years of relative placidity in terms of the environmental movement and of, of things being protected. You know, for instance, all the offshore Arctic has been protected, as I mentioned. Uh, so now we've emerged from that placidity into a period of tremendous turmoil and change, not only in terms of environment, but culture. God, women's rights, everyone's rights. Uh, so anything could happen. Um, uh, immediately, again, I, um, I'm, my fingers are crossed that the Arctic Refuge is not on the serving platter yet. Um, uh, but we really, it's something that we have to keep our eyes on. And there, there are other places in Alaska that are very mineral rich, whether it be potential gold mines or other areas, uh, offshore oil could be opened again. Uh, so we just have to keep our ear to the ground. That's, that's all I can tell you. They're, they are very concerned in Alaska right now, but a lot of that has to do with change at the federal levels. Yes? So uh, you mentioned the Inuit. I was really curious if there are people, like the local communities that you communicated with them as, in, as a part of the planning process or just kind of along the way? Uh, in terms of the Arctic Refuge? Yeah. Yeah, they're... A whole trip from the Pacific to the... Oh. oh, well, on that trip I was focused on something, you know, something else entirely. And I uh, deliberately did live in two different villages in the winter of... Uh, uh, 1999, in order that I get to know the, the, uh, the people in the villages so I could understand. Because that, there's a, that landscape's really, there's a cultural part of it all. And you can't pass through it without seeing these beautiful rock cairns that they build called Anuxuits, or are, you know, just being part of this hunting culture, whether you meet the hunters in the villages or outside of the villages. So I spent a lot of time connecting with and being introduced to village elders and becoming part of that. And it was lovely because, uh, you know, if you fly into some of these very remote villages that I visited, they're not necessarily welcoming, even though they are very gracious people, I learned, across the north. Uh, but if you jump off of a plane into their village and, and go start asking questions, you're going to be rebuffed because culturally, for one thing, they're just, they don't like to talk. They consider it rude to be asked questions. But by coming in from the wilderness and what was their ancestral tool, a kayak, uh, people would run down to the shore to greet me and to offer me food. And they, were, they would ask me questions about the wildlife that I saw and where it was and if they might be able to find a beluga to hunt or, um, and if I liked it there. And they knew that I did because I was alone, like, like their ancestors. And some of them had been. So it was an intense personal connection uh, again and again. It was profound. And it, 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 I, do, I didn't have time to address that this evening. I, I address it at length in my book, Arctic Crossing, if you'd like to have a look. Yes? 
I'm curious about the question, so following up on the question about your fears in, in regard to being afraid that you aren't going to be able to accomplish what you set out to do. And is that fear related to wilderness and adventure experiences, or does that also apply to fear of being able to complete a book you set out to do, or a movie, or to communicate something to the world? It's all of the above. And, you know, I find that it's very similar, you know, starting the first page of a book that might be 400 pages. That, that, you know, the blank page can be just as scary as being at base camp at the bottom of a mountain. Uh, and these, I, I was hoping to speak to something that we all have within us, is that we, we in fact have almost infinite powers if we're just willing to, to take some risks and try things. And that's what I was trying to address. It was not the sheer physical challenge so much as the, the mental head game of these things that I've uh, taken on that you all inevitably will take on or have taken on. Yes? Are you showing a movie at the Rexy tomorrow night? No, that is a, 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 a incorrect. I'm, I'm giving a talk much like tonight, but on an entirely different subject. And I'm talking about my journey from source to sea on the Colorado River, which is a multi-year research project and a five-month journey. And there will be free beer if you come. <laughs> <laughs> Tomorrow night at the Roxy, free admission, free beer. Uh, and uh, I can, I'm going to be talking about river protection in the southwest as well as a, 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 an adventure I got to take part in. Yes? You had several questions about fears. And you showed the instance in which the polar bear was coming at you and you turned around. What was your plan of action if the bear had come into your tent, <laughs> or really close to your tent? What was your plan? Well, the first year uh, uh, that I went a much shorter distance just to see if I could handle being alone for such lengthy periods of time, I did not carry a shotgun. And the Inuit hunters I met were aghast because I took out my bear mace and showed it to them. And, and the, the elder I showed it to just shook his head and said, that just pissed the bear off. <laughs> uh, so I did, uh, after that, I realized it was just silly not to carry a shotgun. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, when I met that polar bear, it was, it, was really, it was September. It was really cold out, and I couldn't reach the shotgun. Um, so, um, and, and of course, I, wouldn't have, I didn't want to shoot a bear. It was, only would have been a, a last resort. In the tent, it's a little more problematic, and that's why I had those windows sewn in my tent so that I could look out. It's terrible being blind in your tent. Um, I, I never, some people that are on solo trips often string fishing line around their tents with bells on it that will wake you up or startle the bear that, as it trips across the fishing line. Um, but uh, it, it, maybe I was lucky. But maybe I also was relying on, on remnant instincts within me to know what I could do and what I couldn't do. And again and again, I knew when I was around bears. And it wasn't because there were several occasions where I didn't see them or smell them or even see the sign of them. And I knew I was in the presence of another animal. It's, uh, it's, I think that we all have that capability. As for meeting that polar bear at the end of my journey, it was, it was luck that the polar bear uh, didn't continue the chase. But maybe that was a communication that I made to that bear by turning the kayak. Now, w what I haven't told you is that I spent years as a park ranger repeatedly dealing with wild bears coming into my campsite, uh, shooting them with rubber bullets, learning how to shoot a bear, not to kill it, uh, and being stalked by bears repeatedly. And I've never been comfortable around big bears because they're wild and unpredictable. But I at least knew how I should respond and the kinds of ways I could communicate with a bear. And spinning my kayak around and facing the bear is making a statement versus charging the bear, which is making another aggressive statement, versus fleeing, which is, sets off the predator-prey relationship. So I, it may have seemed simpler than it really was, but there was a lot of uh, thought and time put into those encounters that allowed me to, for the most part, to get away with them. Yeah? 
I just have a question on your writing process, whether you, how you, if you turn and write from memory or you, yeah, just on the writing process of the books and also photography sort of acted as a veil sometimes where um, maybe, yeah, was a filter between you and the wilderness. I just finished a magazine assignment today, and I was I was, uh, uh, you know, in a state of panic because I couldn't find my journal, and I found it at last minute, and that is the first ingredient to to being a good writer, particularly if you're journaling and taking long journeys, and you need to get dialogue when you don't have a tape recorder, uh, so journal is essential, but for me. Uh, because I've always been interested in images, my photographs are almost as valuable as the, the journals that I keep. Because when I can't get it out of the journal, I turn to my pictures and look at them. And now it's so much easier because they're on the com our computers, digitized. And you know the old cliche about how many words those photos are worth, it's true. And you can evoke uh, many words from a from even a mediocre photograph, and plus they trigger memories. And when I was young, I tended to believe that, ah, I'll remember that. But you, you never do. And there are nuances in these experiences, whatever you're writing about, that need to be captured immediately, as soon as you can. Um, the, the, the field biologist I mentioned, whom I traveled with in the Arctic in 2006, has saved more species around the world than anyone alive. Uh, and he always had a journal right here and a couple of pencils uh, at the ready. And he was constantly taking notes. And I know that's very old school. It's, some people think of that biologist as a dinosaur, but he wrote a lot of books. And, uh, and uh, that's how he did it. That's how I like to do it. And of course, finally, you know, reading. You know, we're all, we have to be careful because we're all parrots and we all tend to want to mimic things we've read or heard before. But this, for me, it's an essential tool. It's to read all I can about a place uh, in order to have the background information. Well, thanks. Uh, one more question, yeah. Have you ever taken your Emmy with you on? <laughs> 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 no, but I'll give it a try. It would look pretty good if I glued it onto the bow of the kayak, wouldn't it? <laughs> All right, well, free beer tomorrow night, the Roxy.